All right. Well, welcome everyone. We are just past 11 o'clock. So there may be some others trickling in. I see a couple of people coming in here. Um, but we are going to get started. Uh, my name is Lea Gleason. I am the new Communications and Community Engagement Director for Sierra Nevada Alliance. And I will be running our monthly webinars in the future, which is a great pleasure of mine. And today for our October webinar, I'm so excited to introduce you to Gavin Furman. Uh, he's a naturalist and nature photographer who's joining us from the South Lake Tahoe Library. Today, he's going to talk about observing the natural world with an eye towards shaping and sharing the stories that we find there. And you'll learn all about what that means. Gavin uses nature photography and nature writing, both from well and lesser known authors, to reinforce good observation techniques and illustrate how interpreting scientific observation into affecting stories can not only enrich our own experiences, but can also help build towards a culture of stewardship. So super excited to see his work. After his talk, we'll have some time for Q&A. So if any questions come up for you while he's presenting, feel free to drop them in the chat. Or if you prefer afterwards, you can just raise your hand and say them verbally. And we're going to get into his talk in just a moment. But first, I just want to put out a little reminder and give you an invite to mark your calendars for noon on November 30th. We will have our November webinar focused all around a digital brown bag lunch and meeting us at the Alliance and the exciting release of our annual report. So if you wanna hear what we've been up to, if you have any questions for us or wanna to get to know more about our programming and the great stuff that we're doing for this Sierra Nevada region, please come and join us. We would love to meet you. It will be very informal and a nice time to gather around the holidays. So with that said, I'm gonna let you take it away, Gavin. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Gavin, and I'm speaking on behalf of the South Lake Tahoe Library. Uh, just to give a, us a quick plug here, uh, besides making programs like mine possible, the library lets us lets you check out kind of fun stuff like field guides, amateur naturalist backpacks, and California State Park passes for free parking at California State Parks. Um, super easy to get a library card, and it's pretty cool, too, if I you know, can unbiasedly say so myself. Uh, so as a library kid, I believe in the power of story to help us understand the world around us, um, whether it's scientific or artistic, whether it's done through language or other arts and mediums, uh, story helps us to bring the world into perspective. It's, uh, it connects us with other people, places, you know, times and points of view. It helps us to understand how the world fits together and how we fit within it. Um, as an amateur naturalist and nature photographer, the, the the complexity of the natural world is, you know, become a perpetual source of wonder and discovery. You know, if we if we bring both our head and heart to the task, we can see it as a place of endless stories out there. Um, you know, uh, in constant growth and evolution. Uh, here in this picture, we're looking at uh, a great blue heron in the late winter on the upper Truckee Marsh where the Truckee River feeds into Lake Tahoe. Um, the lake itself doesn't freeze, but the shallows along the shore can ice over. And this heron um, is hunting uh, while gingerly walking over the ice. And uh, as the day as the day warms up, the ice begins to break under its weight in some places, and it kind of kept falling through maybe a foot or two down and throwing out its wings to steady itself. Um, and if you've, you've never seen them be awkward, it's always uh, pretty, pretty hilarious to watch such a graceful bird look kind of just as dumb as the rest of us when we uh, <laughs> slip or stumble. Um, but there was also this moment where it turned just kind of just so into the thin winter light out there and there's this beautiful crisp shadow um passed onto its wing and you feel like you've just seen some kind of small mystery revealed uh, you know it's one of those meaningful moments that are also kind of obscure and difficult to put into words um and that's what we'll be talking about are ways to examine those types of moments and open them up 
uh, to keep them vital and alive and be able to share them with others. Um, to that end, I'll be presenting tips and stories alongside nature writing to give us a sense of the possibilities when we're telling our stories. Um, I like to think that uh, maybe our stories are a little bit like that shadow. Um, it isn't it isn't the thing itself, but it's as faithful an impression as we can get and you know, an organic moment that we want to be able to capture and preserve. Uh, the first piece of writing I'd like to share with you expresses that desire to capture capture a moment and the tension of trying to convey it to another rather beautifully. Uh, this is The Heron by Hayden Carruth. Uh, he's a poet from, or was a poet from the Northeastern U.S. who frequently wrote about the natural world, and he published this late in his career in 1997. Let me tell you, my dear, about the heron I saw by the edge of Dave Halflet's lovely, lovely little pond. A great blue heron standing perfectly still where it had been studying Dave's rainbows and brookies beneath the surface. And I too stood perfectly still, as perfectly as I could. Not 20 feet away, each of us contemplative and quiet. Communication occurred. I felt it. Not just simple wonder and apprehension, but curiosity and concern. It was evident. The great bird in its heraldic presence, so beautifully marked, so poised against the dark green water. I had my raggedness with my cigarette smoldering, my eyes squinting, my cap tilted back two invisibly beating hearts. Then the impetus lapsed. The heron nodded and flew away. I turned back into Dave's workshop and picked up a wrench. If, it, if goodness exists in this world, and it does, then this moment was the paradigm of it, a, a recognition, a life in conjunction with a life. But why am I compelled to tell you about it? It was wordless. And why, over and over again, must I write this poem? And hopefully we've all had at least one or two experiences out in the natural world where we've felt a bit awestruck by something beautiful or profound like this. Um, poem raises the question, how do we get our stories to convey what we felt in those moments? Um, how do we capture something that seems indefinable? And I would say that a good place to start is with observation. Um, so what is observation? We can say that it's seeing a moment clearly and in detail, but it's also seeing outside the moment uh, by paying close attention and making educated guesses. In observing, we're collecting details and moments like we would rocks or feathers. Um, hopefully you all do that when you're <laughs> outdoors. Um, turning those moments we collect over in our mind helps us to understand our experiences and how they connect to the greater world. Um, so thinking about the process, how that process works in our head, we can um, break observation down into three parts. Um, there's perception, interpretation, and memory. So we experience something with one or more of our senses, hopefully, hopefully a few. Um, our mind makes what sense it can out of the experience. And then we record it in our in our messy little notebook up here. <laughs> um, Obviously, it's not a manual mechanical process. It, it works so fluidly that we don't think about it, but the crux of it is interpretation, and that's what we'll be focusing on here. Um, interpretation is about engaging your mind with your senses. It's about using your knowledge to gain a deeper understanding of what you experience. Um, without interpreting what we see, we might as well be cameras, right? You know, <laughs> here. Paraphrase Sherlock Holmes, uh, without interpretation, you are seeing Watson, but you are not observing. Um, interpretation gives order and meaning to our experiences. Um, it's important to remember, though, that quality interpretation flows from what you're actually witnessing. And you should always verify your interpretations as much as you're able by checking their accuracy against established scientific knowledge, you know, so we're not making things up when we're out there. Uh, this is especially important when we're trying to understand more complex things like animal behavior. And it's it's critical when we approach the more kind of unknowable things like animal thought and emotions. Um, when communicating about nature, it's, it's 
it's nearly impossible to fully avoid anthropomorphism um, like we strive to when we're, you know, engaged in purely scientific inquiry. But even if we could avoid it, we'd have something, you know, clinical and precise, but probably not something that connects with most people on an emotional level. Um, it's okay to speculate in our stories. We just need to make sure that our speculation is supported by observation and uh, at least not contradicted by available science right? so that um so that the our stories authentically reflect reflect the world um so what can we get out of observing this coyote um set the scene for you we're we're near a marsh in the desert outside of fallon nevada if anybody's been there it's stillwater national wildlife refuge um it's a 90 plus summer's day, so pretty balmy out there. And this coyote has just loped up out of an irrigation ditch in the middle of this gravel road and stopped to stare at us. Um, what, what can we observe that might help us to see outside this moment? If we look kind of around the cheek and, you know, the neck and the muzzle there, you, we, we can see that it's kind of wet and has a bit of dried muck on the nose, right? So if we're out on a hot day and it's wet around a large part of its face, what can we guess happen? It'd probably just plunge its face into some water, right? Um, what else can we see on its chin here? Um, looks like some blood there. Uh, if we take that with the wetness, what can we guess happen? Probably just ate something out of the water, right? We um, you know, could we, could we guess what it might have eaten? It's probably something that it only needed to put its face in to get rather than its whole body. So, you know, something probably close to the side. Uh, some guesses might be a frog or a muskrat. Uh, probably not a fish or a bird because that, you know, would have gotten more wet getting further into the water. And birds... I mean, they, they can eat a bird hole, but, uh, you know, they tend to leave down traces and, you know, feathers around there. Um, but that's probably as good as we can say for certain. But, you know, my money's on it probably being a frog. Uh, so that's basic observation. And, and its goal is always an attempt to understand what's going on out there. Um, Creative observation has that same aim as well, but it also tries to move towards expressing our observation, leans leans into the actual, you know, creation of it, uh, recreating an experience by considering and highlighting details. Uh, a framework for getting started uh, might be to think in three categories, um, physicality, explanation, and the takeaway. Physicality being what details help us to recreate the experience? Um, explanation would be what would help someone to understand what happened that we saw. And the takeaway, what what meaning might it convey for you and others? Um, if you notice, that's all almost a mirroring of perception, interpretation, and memory. Uh, so with those guideposts in mind, how can we observe this coyote with a cre creative eye? Um, we can ask about physicality with questions like, how would we convey the shape of those ears? How would we convey its posture? What, what words might convey the color of its fur or eyes for somebody who wasn't here seeing it with us? Um, in the 30s, a poet by the name of Kenneth Porter um, described a coyote as having a, a coat the color of sand with pine pitch eyes and moving on feet of steel and thistle down. Um, those descriptions are simple and still poetic, uh, we, but I mean, we don't have to worry about whether ours are poetic too. Simply thinking about how we could describe something helps to solidify it and convey it to others. Um, so what are ways that we can explain what we think happened to make it more real to us and those we might share it with? Um, Maybe we think about how it might feel to plunge your muzzle in the mucky water, you know, on a hot day, the taste and feel of biting into a nice slimy frog, you know, when it's that hot outside. Uh, you know, we probably don't want or need to 
be able to define that with certainty. Uh, you know, no, no judgment if you do, but uh, <laughs> we can use our experience, our sense of smell and other observations to make an educated guess on what that might be like for the coyote. Um, you know, the taste, the texture, the smell, the the relief of a meal and a splash of cool water on a hot day. You know, these are all things we can think about and approximate to, you know, to varying degrees and link up to our own experience. You know, like how did, how did the heat of the day feel to us? How did, how did the air smell with a mix of bitter brush, marsh, muck, and dust? <laughs> In searching for takeaways, we can get a little more into speculation and, look for meanings and things like what does that expression say to us you know would that would it mean the same thing to another coyote how does it how's that expression different from this coyote's um on ranch land in autumn uh what, what do you think they see when they look at us how do how do those expressions differ from this one what what might this one be thinking as it approaches us uh, across the iced over snow on, on Lake Tahoe shore? Uh, what, what are we in a coyote's eye? You know, um, we could go further afield and ask things like what music might capture the movement of a coyote bounding over marsh grass? Uh, how would that music change to capture the slow stride of coyote paws swishing through snow crystals you know it sounds like sweeping through a delicate clutter of glass you know what is that first coyote's life like out in the desert sun what might it have done after we lost sight of it so what separates the kind of joy you see on their faces when running in a pack from the behavior you see in a lone coyote out in the wild. Um, how does our experience fit in with our past experiences of coyotes and with our collected human knowledge of their lives? These are you know, questions we can ask to get a little more creatively into what we're seeing. And um, observing nature creatively is just, it's searching for that core of an experience that opens it up for us. Uh, searching for something that lets us see our experience in the context of the wider world of natural history. Um, our next piece is a good example of that in action. Uh, this is Shorebirds by W.S. Merwin. He's a former U.S. poet laureate uh, who frequently wrote about the natural world. While I think of them, they're growing rare after the distances they have followed all the way to the end for the first time, tracing a memory they did not have until they set out to remember it at an hour when all at once it was late and newly silent and the white had turned white around them. Then they rose in their choir on a single note, each of them alone between the pull of the moon and the humped undertone of the earth below them. The glass curtains kept falling around them as they flew in search of their place before they were anywhere, and storms winnowed them. They flew among the places with towers and past the tower lights where some vanished with their long legs for waiting in shadow. Others were caught and stayed in the countries of the nets and in the lands of lime twigs some fastened, and after the countries of guns at first light, fewer of them than I remember would be here to recognize the light of late summer when they found it playing with darkness along the wet sand. So in this picture is a Western sandpiper, again on the shore of Lake Tahoe. Um, these birds travel about 12,500 miles a year. They winter in Alaska and summer from the Southern US uh, down to upper South America. Uh, so this one would be stopping here halfway through their journey. Um, it, it has a hurt wing, it's not, irreparably broken, but likely pulled. Uh, this poem lets us really feel what those miles might mean to a bird like this. The, the bravery of carrying on evoked as light playing with darkness. Um, what it can mean to see these little guys skittering down the beaches. If we, if we think a little deeper about that 12,500 miles, um, this, is, this is just a small bird that would probably fit in your hand pretty well. Uh, in the course of just one year in its life, it might see bald eagles and harpy eagles, uh, coyotes and capybara, moose, mallards, and river dolphins. You know, it, 
And in each of these habitats that it goes through, it has to know how to survive, you know, when it gets there. It's it's kind of quietly amazing what they what they might have seen in their small lives. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we can use three tools to help us get a glimpse into a subject's experience of the world like this kind of poem illustrates and um, to look at nature with creative wonder, but also with authenticity, humility and respect. Um, and to be able to share those experiences with others. Um, our first tool then is naming. Uh, names help us to be more precise and concise in sharing an experience with someone else, you know, because it makes sure that we're talking about the same thing, right? Uh, but they also make our perceptions themselves more accurate. Um, knowing what to call things helps us to orient them in our minds. Um, names are little kernels that store everything we associate with that name in our brain and connect them to other kernels with related information. Um, with every new bit of knowledge that we learn, either from others or firsthand experience, our associations with that name change and they grow. Um, mm -hmm. So we can name each species we see, but each part of something is also a name that helps us to orient ourselves. Uh, each of these names can help us to see deeper into our subject's world. Knowing the name of something leads to understanding its function, which can lead to better understanding its life and behavior. Letting someone hearing our story look through that window too is it's a pretty powerful way that we can make it more real and effective for them. Um, you know, we could see that how that works with a quick demonstration. Um, for those are those of you who have never seen one, this is a, a juvenile Cooper's hawk. Um, you know, whether you're familiar with the species or not, uh, take a second to think about what your idea of a Cooper's hawk, even if it's just this picture here. Um, uh, I'll explain some ornithology terms, but I'll also ask you to consider what they mean for the life of this hawk. And then you can ask yourself after if it changes how, you, how, how you're seeing it. Um, first, uh, Cooper's hawk is an accipiter. Uh, that's a genus of slender hawks with long tails. Um, there's three accipiter species in North America that occur. Um, all three hunt other birds almost exclusively. They can they can and will fly up to 50 miles an hour through trees and even more dense ve vegetation, you know, when they're chasing their prey. In studies, they found that up to 25% of adult Cooper's hawks have evidence of yield over damage to their breastbones um, from just from slamming into trees and other obstacles as they're going that fast. Uh, that doesn't count the number of them that are outright killed that way. Um, and interpreting those, those facts into kind of meaningful insight, we can ask things like, what might it feel like to hunt at 50 miles an hour? What, you know, what, what's that learning curve like if you need to learn to move and hunt at those speeds just to eat? Um, what might that mean for how a Cooper's hawk thinks about the world as it grows or how it regards its young and teaches its young as they grow. Um, next, we can think about, uh, we can think about eye color. Um, this is a young Cooper's hawk and we can see that its eyes are kind of a lemony yellow. As a Cooper's hawk ages, their eyes turn to orange and usually then to a deep blood red. Um, sometimes they stay orange even as a full adult, but they, they usually age through to red. Um, what might that feel like to have your eyes change color like that? Uh, you know, do, do they know it's changing as it's happening? You know, would, would, would we know if our eyes changed without being able to look in the mirror? You know, <laughs> um, does the color change affect their vision? Um, the science doesn't really have an answer for that. Uh, but for reference, those of us with brown eyes, um, tend to be less sensitive to brightness and glare, where those of us with blue eyes are more sensitive to glare. That, that also means that those with blue eyes tend to have a better ability to see in the dark. So changing eye color likely has some effect for the hawks. Um, still focusing around the eye, the superorbital ridge is what gives them that strong to, defined brow um, in this uh, kind of, 
this is a top-down view of a Cooper's hawk skull. Um, the the supraorbital ridges are these little bones that kind of come out over the eye socket, um, and they, you know, you can see the the definite brow up here. Um, this protects their eyes again from you know the dangers of their lifestyle. If if a raptor loses an eye, it's pretty much pretty much game over. So they want to keep them safe. Uh, uh, this one's head is, it's, it's only slightly angled, but if you pay attention when you're seeing hawks outside, a lot of the time they, they tend to angle their head slightly down um, with their eyes up, kind of like a boxer does for defense, you know, um, that that might help them shade their eyes from the glare. Maybe, maybe it helps to reduce the amount of wind directly hitting their eyes. You know, there's science also doesn't have a, a completely great answer for that. Um, last, uh, do you know where a bird's ear is located? Logically, it's right behind the eye like most animals, but we can tell where it is by following their feathers. Um, if you kind of start uh, right under the mouth here and kind of follow these lines and see how it makes a kind of semicircle there back around to the back of the eye. This is a good way to draw birds too, if you're ever <laughs> interested in that, but... Um, this kind of semicircular shape is the are, are the auricular feathers, and that's where their that's where their um, ear canal is right behind there. Um, the those feathers act like a they act like the foam on a microphone head. They they dampen wind sound so that you know you're hearing more clearly. You're not you know getting that rush of wind. What do you what do you think the rush of noise must be like barreling through pines and other trees at 50 miles an hour you know <laughs> we could we could stick our heads outside of a car window and get it, get a decent idea of that you know but uh, imagine trying to steer the car with that wind coming straight at your face you know um and then then imagine trying to concentrate on flying and following prey physically maneuvering and you know everything else with that going on right it just makes it that much more impressive that they're they're able to actually catch prey that way <laughs> you know um so that's just four little windows into this hawk's world but already it feels more real to us just by considering the meaning of a few names um and you can use that to deepen someone's experience of your story as well with, you know, not just stopping at the name, but kind of trying to convey what, what that means, you know, in their life. Um, you know, and we can look for ways that that might resonate with our own human lives, uh, as the author does in our next piece. Um, if you've never seen an eagle yawn, this is what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> um the selection, though, is from an essay titled uh, Rapturous by Brian Doyle. He used to write in the Pacific Northwest about all kinds of things, but um, one of his returning themes was the natural world and specifically how totally cool raptors are. So here he is. Um, I mean, who could possibly not be awed by a tribe whose various members can see a rabbit clearly from a mile away? Eagles. Fly sideways through trees, tree branches like feathered fighter jets. That's wood hawks. And this is another uh, young juvenile Cooper's hawk. Um, look like tiny, brightly colored linebackers, kestrels with their cool gray helmets. Hunt absolutely silently on the wing. That's owls. This is a long eared owl. Fly faster than any other being on earth. That's falcons. This is a prairie falcon and can spot a trout from 50 feet in the air, gauge piscine speed and direction, and nail the dive and light refraction and wind gust and trout startle so perfectly that it snags three fish a day. That's our friend, the osprey. And not to mention they look cool. They're seriously large. They have muscles on their muscles. They're stone cold efficient hunters with built-in butchery tools, and all of them have this stern, I could kick your ass, but I'm busy look, which took me years to discover was not a general simmer of surliness, but a result of the superorbital ridge protecting their eyes. 
Maybe the reason that so many human beings are as hawk-addled and owl-absorbed and falcon-haunted and egomaniacal as me is because we, we wish to live like them, to use them like stars to steer by, to remember to be as alert and unafraid as they are. Maybe being rapturous is in some way rapturous. Maybe what the word rapture really means is an attention so ferocious that you see the miracle of the world as the miracle it is. Maybe that is what happens to saints and mystics who float up in the air and soar beyond sight and vanish finally into the glare of the sun. So for anyone who's ever watched a raptor or another bird soar off until it's so distant it disappears, this is a, it's a strong evocation of the awe, you know, you feel seeing that. And, and he's also being playful with words even beyond egomaniacal, which is hilarious. Uh, he talks of saints and mystics and connects the word raptor to rapture. Uh, both words share the same root and they both mean to seize or to grasp. Um, so with a rapture, you're being seized by emotion, you know, with a raptor, you're being seized by sharp talons. Uh, the hawk comes from the same, from a different route, but also means to grasp, to seize like that. Um, the word osprey uh, is a sl slurring of the, the Latin word for bird of prey, um, avis preyed, you know, so osprey. Yeah, you know, so you can have a lot of fun investigating names and playing with words as well, you know. Um, uh, you probably noticed that I've been asking a, a lot of questions. So our next tool is questioning. Um, in asking questions, we dissect our experiences and try to better understand our subject, but we're also searching for patterns and connections, how, how things fit together. Um, to get creative with our questions, it helps to look at them, you know, like an artist's tools. Uh, ask, what do I need to know to make that shade of green just right? Um, I mean, look how many shades of green are in this picture alone. Um, wh what words capture that expression on an animal's face or the the tone of its call? Uh, since I'm a photographer, I'll ask what, what can bring my subject into focus? Um, uh, one way to do that is to practice zooming in and zooming out by switching gears between, between focused and diffuse thought. Um, Usual example of this is to think of focused thought as a flashlight. It's it's good for illuminating and looking at details. Um, diffuse thought is more like a lamp. It's it's not focused on one thing, and it's not really good for studying things closely. But um, it's showing us more of the world around us. Um, so focused thought is concentrating on a specific thing or topic. Um, diffuse thought is relaxing that focus and allowing your mind to drift a bit and make connections. It's it's kind of daydreaming with purpose. Um, helping the listener to see and make their own connections can make it more real for them. Uh, you know, so what are ways we can turn this principle towards story? Um, we can try coaching ourselves to ask three different kinds of questions, experiential, connective, and philosophical. Um, experiential being, uh, you know, questions that get us closer to our experience of our subjects, you know. Um, Connective questions are, are those that help us to understand how our subject relates to the world and, and to us because we're part of the world, right? Um, philosophical questions are more wide-ranging ones that help to provoke deeper thought. Um, if you'll notice, that's a nice progression um, from focus to diffuse thought in those questions. Um, stepping into this moment here, um, we're walking in July on the Rainbow Trail at uh, Taylor Creek in Lake Tahoe, and we we come upon this frog just off the trail. And as we focus in on it, we might be surprised to see that there are three other kinds of creatures on the frog. Um, so to start with naming, this is an American bullfrog. The spider appears to be a mouse spider or a Scotophaeus black walleye. Um, it's named after a, a mouse because of the gray on its abdomen here. Um, and how it skitters on the ground when it hunts, uh, you know, it hunts on the ground rather than using a web. Um, the bug is a mosquito. Uh, the fact that it's feeding on a frog, frog makes a strong argument that it is of the Kulex genus, which, hooray guys, it only feeds on reptiles, amphibians, and pastoring birds, not us. <laughs> you know, so we, we don't have to hate this guy. Um, the 
eggs are fish eggs. Um, they're not frog eggs, uh, but beyond that, it's difficult to tell um, that a lot of the fish eggs look really similar, um, which is the time that, you know, we, we can narrow it down to looking at our time. Um, we're here in July, which is the time that trout might be spawning. Um, so our best guess is probably trout eggs. Um, so for experiential questioning, uh, we can start with things like, what is that spot just behind the eye? If you guessed ear, you're, you're half right. <laughs> it is where they hear from, but it's essentially a large eardrum with no opening called the tympanic membrane. Um, I think tympani, like in an orchestra. Uh, it lets them hear both under and above water. Does that change how they hear relative to our hearing? Is it more muted or just as clear? Maybe, maybe somehow clearer. Uh, a female American bullfrog will have a tympanic membrane about the size of its eye. Um, a male's will be much bigger. So we know this is probably a female, right? Um, a frog's skin is also thin and porous and they, they respirate or breathe through their skin, which is where they get about 70% of their air. <laughs> So her, her skin is also much more sensitive than ours. So we might ask how that changes the sensations of a spider crawling on her back, right? <laughs> or, or, you know, a mosquito biting her back. Can she feel that even more than we do? Um, for that matter, the legs of the spider are pretty sensitive themselves. You know, how does that feel to it walking on a slightly mucousy back of a frog, you know, how, how is that different in a tactile sense from the sticky feel of their web? Um, pulling our focus slightly back for connective questions. Um, is this frog native? Um, nope, it's, uh, it's an invasive species from the Eastern US um, and we probably don't want it in Taylor Creek where it was at. Um, its competition is pictured here. That's our hometown hero, the, the Pacific tree frog, small but mighty. Um, this is decently a decently accurate representation of the size difference between these species. Um, so you can see why bullfrogs may be out competing these little guys for food. Um, they, they just outright eat the littler species at every one of each of their life stages. Um, so putting that into a story frame, we can ask the, what that might be like for the Pacific tree frog to all of a sudden have had these comparatively gargantuan frogs literally eat them out of house and home, you know, but do you think the bullfrog sees it the same way? Um, the mouse spider, by contrast, is an introduced species from British regions. Uh, the difference between introduced and invasive is is that an introduced species uh, doesn't really upset and unbalance the environment they've been introduced to, whereas an invasive species can cause drastic changes in the new environment. Um, pulling, pulling back more to a philosophical range, you know, is, is an invasive species a bad thing? Um, the value of biodiversity tells us that it's definitely is bad from the point of view of health a healthy and diverse ecosystem, um, even beyond their threat to the Pacific tree frog, uh, the American bullfrog's higher breeding rate, breeding rates can unbalance the whole food web of an area um, that they're introduced to. And, you know, for that reason, we, like I said, we don't want them in Taylor Creek. Um, but maybe if you're a hungry coyote or a thirsty mosquito on a hot day, you think differently, right? Um, we'll probably never be able to know what exactly an animal is thinking, but that raises a for more fundamental question um, as we get more diffuse out there. Is it is it still helpful to ask questions that we know we probably can't answer? Um, to that, I'd say there's more value in a question than whether it has an answer. Uh, sometimes you might be able to fill in that blank for your listener, but other times it can be more effective to simply share your questions and let someone turn those over in their own minds. Um, questions help us to break down the world into more manageable chunks. And it's that spirit of exploration and reaching out towards mystery that keeps us growing and expanding our knowledge and experience. Um, our next piece illustrates that breaking down and does a good job of showing the interplay between focused and diffuse thought to boot. Um, 
This is a selection from a much longer poem, Debris, by Nick, Vicki Graham. Um, she's a poet from the Northeastern US writing here about the Northwest. Um, this one requires that we learn uh, or remind ourselves of a few terms uh, to get at the meaning. So I'll explain the first one and you'll see a couple of explanations pop up as I'm reading. Um, firstly, uh, a symbiont is a member of a symbiotic relationship where each partner gives for the betterment of both. For example, lichen is a partnership between an algae and a fungus. Um, symbiont usually refers to the smaller partner in the relationship. So in, in her coining the word co-symbionts, um, maybe we can say that she'd like us to think about our relationship with the earth as you know symbiotic and that we would be collective smaller members of that partnership. So this is um, co-symbionts, geologist, hydrologist, botanist, saprophyte, raptor, arthropod, uh, a watershed broken into species by specialists. Like science, poetry is an art of dissection. It is the tiniest part the poet wants. Fern spore, leaf pore, bud scar, the vein of an insect wing catching the sun, the barbs and rockies of a swallow's feather in flight. Like science, like poetry, love for a place is an art of dissection. The fingertip strokes the smooth pockets of Lobaria oregana. The eye sinks into the calypso orchid's silks, and at dusk, the last note of a thrush trembles in the ear. So this excerpt then is about that attention that comes through wonder when we when we love a place or person or anything. We're we're eager to learn more. You know, we we care about the details, the pieces that make up the whole of it. Um, Questions help you to look closer and they have a naturally dissective quality. Um, we break things down for answers and use them to build back up to understanding. Um, another way to do that is with our last tool metaphor. Um, we can think of all things as being made up of a collection of meanings just as much as their collection of chemical elements. Um, for instance, a, a bird carries meanings and associations like it's something with a beak wings, feathers, and clawed feet. It's something that sings at the dawn of day, sings to defend territory and to attract a mate. It's something that's free in the air, something quick, something sometimes colorful, it hatches from eggs, etc. Um, in making metaphors, we break a subject down into these elemental meanings. In other words, we dissect it, and then we, we hook those meanings up to a similar subject or to you know, more complex ideas, emotions, and language. Uh, and language, um, our our minds make simple metaphors almost automatically to better understand things and let us kind of reach further with our understanding than we could before. Um, a metaphor can highlight complexities, but it's always about simplification. It's about letting us grasp that complexity. You know, there's that. There's that idea of grasp, grasping again, that raptorial, ferocious attention we, we want to give to what we observe. Um, the key to keep in mind while working, whoop, one further than I meant to. Um, the key to keep in mind uh, while working with metaphors is to start simple and stay playful. You know, the, the easiest uh, way towards making metaphors a conscious response to our experiences by simply asking ourselves, you know, what does it remind us of? Um, it's, it's not a whole lot going on in this photo, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't get fun and rewarding observations out of it. Um, we're looking at the bottom half of a red fir cone um, broken off and sitting on an old log. Um, there are also some unlucky ants here that have uh, wandered into the center of it and been trapped in the sap there. Uh, you might have made the connection immediately, but it looks an awful lot like a flower. Um, breaking that impression down, that's because of shared meanings. Uh, you know, it's something radiating out from the center in a blossoming shape. It's its scales look like petals, etc. Um, that's that's why I took the picture, and I probably mistook it for a flower at first glance and went over. Oh, uh, um, simple concrete metaphors like this can be effective for stories. Um, it's just the act itself of making a connection helps us to remember and describe it for others. Um, you know, like 
I, I saw half a fir cone broken open like a flower cupped with salmon pink petals, yellow green at the tips, framed by the cracked bark of an old log stippled white like a dusting of snow. Um, the resin has a gently sweet smell and subtle herby spiciness to it with a kind of woody undertone. I mean, that, that resin really does smell really great if you get it, you know. Um, it smells so good that you don't even mind getting it on your hands and getting sticky, you know. <laughs> Small group of ants was stuck in that sap at its center, maybe mistaking it for a flower too. Yeah, that, that's that's a good enough description for sharing an experience. Um, if we want to go further, we can ask what that metaphor can convey, how it can connect to an emotion, an idea, a scientific concept, or to other language. Um, part of that is asking what your experience meant to you and then asking what it might mean to another. So we have our metaphor, the cone is a flower. And the ants is something following a sense only to find out it wasn't safe. And then we can explore what that might say about weightier things like life and death, risk and reward, hope and danger. Um, we can use questions to get playful and go further than that as well. You know, do we do we know how ants communicate? Um, they they communicate through pheromones, so through their sense of smell, they can pick up food smells from ten to thirty feet away, which is yeah, it's pretty far for a little ant. Um, when they're walking in lines, they're following pheromones of the ants in front of them that say, follow me. And if they run into danger, and especially if they're hurt or killed, they, they put out a pheromone that tells others not to follow. So I mentioned earlier, you know, how a red fur cone smells. Um, what, that, what might that smell be like to an insect for which, you know, scent is almost a language? Um, if we remember our classics, maybe we can say it could have worked a bit like the siren song in the Odyssey, you know, a beautiful musical scent luring sailors to shipwreck and death. Um, maybe flowers could be something like beckoning islands to insects, uh, holding the promise of food that they can take back to their colony, but also hidden dangers they may not understand. Um, you know, because we want our metaphors to be as authentic as our observations, we need to be careful not to anthropomorphize our subjects and ascribe feelings and thoughts which they might not have. But if we keep that in mind and keep our metaphors rooted to observation, we can understand things that are hard to grasp, like the idea that these ants are an expression of their colony. They're driven to explore the world around them in order to expand that colony and like our early explorers did and like we continue to do in expanding our knowledge through scientific inquiry and the stories we find you know and those metaphors can help to bring out the meaning in the stories we share um, despite its serious tone our next piece is fairly playful with how it uses metaphor to highlight details and convey meaning uh, jay baker was writing this in the late 60s in essex england and this excerpt he describes a sparrow hawk which we don't have here but which is very similar to a cooper's hawk the the one in this picture is how they look at like as adults um the eyes have turned to orange you can see there um they they may or may not go to that deeper uh dark red on that one um but uh the plumage is darker on the back and rufus barred on the front so here's an excerpt from the hill of summer the stillness was broken by a flow of wings. A brown bird flitted low, a fanning of dry quills moving the fronds of the green bracken. Silently it rushed upward and landed on the raised antler of a fallen oak. Its long brown tail streamed out behind it like a wake of shining brown water. It was a hen sparrowhawk. Her back was ridged high, her curved head pecked the air. Pale upon the early gloom, flung up against it like a stranded wave, she shone with involuntary light. The yellow iris of her eyes seemed to fade slowly down to red as though it were reflecting a sunset. It burned towards me, searing through the dusk. I took one step forward. She dived from the tree and rose towards the far side of the plantation where the faint lines of light between the larches now were overgrown by dusk. She flicked the air with the splayed quills of her broad wings as though it were too hot to touch. She flew with a phantasmal buoyancy and deftness, curving the shining snake of her flight between the distant trees. She crossed the last strands of sky. She was a dark feather laid upon the sinking sun. Then she was gone. 
the author largely wrote by taking uh, different experiences from bird watching journals and dramatizing or even kind of weaving them together. Uh, this has several cool metaphors in it, and that's because it's playful in its approach, but precise in what it's trying to capture, you know, um, things like the light and sky overgrown as if fraying out in strands at the edges, um, you know, the shining snake of her flight. These are these are ways we can use metaphors to make our own experiences more vivid and alive when sharing them with others, um, you know, while still giving an authentic and accurate description of what we experience. Um, so let's quickly bring those tools and tips together when looking at this picture. Um, we're, we're walking down a small beach early one summer morning on the shore of Lake Tahoe. Um, Scattered around the sand are orange pieces of crawdad chitin, um, claws and shells, which aren't usually seen along this stretch of beach. Um, we see this crawdad and this black-billed magpie locked in a bit of a standoff inland on the beach where the sand meets the beach grass. Um, we can see the crawdad has already lost an antenna. It's uh, partly beneath the magpie's foot down here. Um, a magpie, for those of you that aren't familiar is a playful, mischievous omnivore that, you know, is thought of as noisy and eating most anything it sees. Part of its scientific name, pica, means two-colored, um, referring to the black and white appearance, but it also lends its name to the disorder pica, in which people eat things that aren't food. Um, the crawdad is most likely a signal crayfish since we can see the kind of telltale um, white half circle there around the base of its claw. Um, it, you know, armored in thick chitin, it's it spent most of its life underwater. Its uh, species originally hails from the Pacific Northwest. Um, its scientific name is Pacifasticus lineusculus or gentle pacifist. Um, a focus question that jumps right out is, um, what's going on here? Obviously, they're in conflict, but we can go deeper with natural history knowledge. Um, in contests, contests a, a crawdad will hold up its right claw, which is usually the larger of the two. You know, it's essentially saying, you know, look at the size of this claw, buddy. You don't want to mess with this, right? Um Generally, the one with the bigger claw wins before there's any fighting. Uh, they also curl their tails up underneath them a bit, as you can see it's doing here. Um, so they're ready to both propel themselves backwards and uh, stir up mud in their opponent's face. <laughs> um, are, you, are either of these tactics likely to work? You know, probably, probably not too well, right? Is the magpie worried? Um, we can look at its eye for a clue. Uh, the magpie's eyes normally don't look like this. They're actually kind of a deep blue, but when you see them, they normally look uh, pretty black to our eyes, depending on how the light's hitting them. Um, but it looks milky white here because it's got its nictitating eyelid up. Um, that's a, a third eyelid that they can um, kind of bring down over their eye and still see through, but which protects it from you know scratching and poking. Uh, so the magpie is a bit wary of those little claws, but moving into more diffuse thought, we might ask, you know, whose side are we on? You know, maybe it's not ours to take a side, but maybe the magpie is a little more familiar to us, so we sympathize. Um, maybe we gravitate to the crawdad's plight as the underdog, especially if we call it a gentle pacifist, right? Um, but maybe that changes if we think of it as a member of an invasive species in Lake Tahoe, which it is. Um, lastly, what does it remind us of? What can it convey? Physically, it really reminds me of depictions of David and Goliath, right? <laughs> um, even without that, we might say it can be a symbol of defiance in the face of probable defeat. You know, we, we can look at that clinically and say it, that it's simply an extinctual defense stance that the crawdad is in, but, um, you know, that's woefully unmatched to the circumstances. But regardless of what is actually going on in the creature's mind, maybe we can say that, you know, maybe it seems like foolishness, uh, fatal inability to adapt to circumstances, but maybe that could also convey some sort of no nobility, a, a sense of 
you know, not giving in to fear and the hopelessness of a situation. Um, these are things each of us can only answer for ourselves. And that's that's part of the joy of sharing experiences with others. You know, remember, remember as you're interpreting the natural world, you're also interpreting your reaction to it. Um, the world's constantly changing and so are you as your thoughts and emotions react to it. Um, because we're all wonderfully different, those reactions are gonna be at least slightly different for each of us. Um, we, we talked about Cooper's Hawk and meaning earlier. Um, no one ever has quite the same experiences of Cooper's Hawks because no one on earth has seen the same ones from the same perspective. Uh, when, when somebody mentions Cooper Hawk, I'm gonna have a different set of associations than you might. Um, I'm gonna think about how the first one I ever saw was one that had died after slamming into a tree. You know, I found at the bottom of an old mining pit near Carson Pass. Um, I'm going to think about the one I saw catch a meadow lark with one claw in midair, you know, and drive down into the snow to mantle over it. Uh, or the one I saw pounce on a squirrel and just, just utterly miss and then, <laughs> then look around with the most disappointed face I've ever seen on a hawk. <laughs> um, you know, some of you will have your own associations and some might think of the stories I shared, you know, when they hear Cooper's Hawk, um, but our experiences are all unique and that makes it worthwhile to clarify them with knowledge and contemplation and to share them with others. You know, like, like knowing names, that layering of meaning and memory calls up everything we've known of that kind of bird or what have you. And it, it deepens our sense of the world and the lives of others, but, you know, it can also have a greater effect than that even. Um, in his poem, Healing, Wendell Berry spoke of the world moving to a music so subtle and vast that no ear hears it except in fragments. And and that, that idea, is it's beautiful in its simplicity. Um, what is music but another form of story told in a different way? Um, but we can only get fragments of that grand story, that you know, kind of beautiful symphony out there. Both scientific and artistic approaches to nature help us to connect those fragments together. Using both approaches creatively help us to make our fragments more real to us, uh, more, more real both to us and to others. Um, sharing these fragments, you know, these experiences help to weave them back together uh, into a more whole and complete vision of the world, which works towards building a culture of appreciation, connection, and stewardship. Um, and helping to build a more personal and emotional connection to the world. We're, we're helping to self separate the, val the idea of value from being synonymous with use. Um, the idea that a thing's only value is in whether and how we can use it. Um, sharing stories both professionally through your work or, or personally can help others to build their own appreciation for the wonderful complexity of our world. Um, Sharing stories can help us to light up those higher human qualities like compassion and help to give us a sense of the worth and dignity of all things, even if they're things we'll never know for ourselves. You know, um, you know we, we can consider this on a, on a physical level. The natural world doesn't waste and we all give back what was given to us. Um, why should that be different on the level of our thoughts and memories and experiences? Um, we're the only ones that can pass on these stories and maybe sharing stories is something we're meant to do in a way. It's, you know, something worth thinking about. Um, I'm going to end with a beautiful poem by Patty Ann Rogers, which switches between focused and diffuse thought, uses metaphor, and delves deeper into names to create a story that functions almost as a pledge of connection to the natural world. This contract is not singular. It is present in each shaft of the chickadee's chestnut feathers holding to flesh. Part them on the wing or on the belly down to the hot skin and touch the document. The bonds of this contract are plural and solitary, present in coon paw and river print, in swallow and scat, in rain falling on dry leaves like time and meter, cord to arpeggio to cord. Its terms are forest ashes and crystal, scarlet and persimmon and blood. The cave and sunlit chamber of winter, wind across corn tassel and granite. 
one might believe this contract to be invisible, invisible where the disappearing points of the urchin's spines appear as the motion of the sea, where the shifting reflection of the water willow and the wavering shadow of the water willow merge in part, where truth and lie first draw together and link from pre-death to presence. Like Annie's pleasure contained in the seed-sized dry fruits of the fennel, so the binding signature is contained in the agitation of poplars taken by the wind in the sucker-tipped tube feet of the slender purple starfish, in the release of midnight's cry by root cricket, by poaching owl, again and again inside the purity of tone in the ear of the mind of the bellcaster at his fire, the signal tolling will continue to repeat itself, like the paws of the winged ant stopped, extinct, and unbroken in rock amber, this contract remains its own reiterated event from coming to coming. Here's my hand on it. And there hopefully is all of our hands on that document as well. Um, you know, to, to look at the world as, you know, something to cherish and uh, celebrate and share, you know. Um, so I, I hope this talk will have helped encourage you to look deeper into the natural world and especially to share with others the, the, the meanings and stories as you find there, you know, um, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I'd love to hear any questions or comments you have. And you can always shoot an email or find me out in the world. I love to talk about these things. So thank you again. <laughs>